so uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Clark Buckner. I'm the director at uh, Telematic Media Arts in um, San Francisco's Soma uh, district. Um, I'm here today uh, as a comp to present uh, artist talk with uh, Barry Dupe uh, as a compliment to um, his film Distracted Blueberry, which is currently uh, an online featured uh, screening, uh, which can be found on our website at uh, telematic.com. Uh, while I've got you, um, the show that is currently up in our gallery here, uh, Carla Gannis's Wonder Camera, um, will only be up until Thursday uh, of this week, uh, October 8th, and we will be uh, hosting a closing reception on Thursday evening, and I hope you will uh, consider coming by. Um, so today again, um, I'm delighted to present uh, artist uh, Barry Dupe. Um, to introduce him, let me do this. I need better light, excuse me. He's awkward. Barry Dupe is a Vancouver-based artist primarily working with computer animation. His films use imagery and language derived from the unconscious, developed through writing exercises and automatic drawing. He often creates settings within which a character's self-expression or action is challenged and thwarted, resulting in comic, violent, and poetic spectacles. His films have been screened throughout Canada and internationally, including the Ann Arbor Film Festival, International Film Festival, Rotterdam, Anthology Film Archives, The Lion, Contemporary Art Museum, uh, Pleasure Dome in Toronto, The Mocha in Toronto, Whitechapel Gallery in London, at the Pompidou, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and at the Tate in London. So, Barry, thanks again for uh, doing this with me. Um, I'm grateful to be able to uh, screen your film and, and to talk to you about your work. You know, I presume that uh, the audience has, well, let me take it a step back. As a way to begin, could we just talk about how you first came to uh, animation and uh, the inspiration and uh, for your work as an animator? Um, I first started doing animation in um, in grade school, like in in grade school, like as far as I can remember, starting out with. Uh, Post-it notepads. So um, I would do really simple animations on post-it notepads, and then I was in. I went to Emily Carr, which is the art school, art institute here, um, and I went to a presentation that was given by the animation department. And um, it was really inspiring the way they talked about it. So I applied. They only the classes were really small. They take uh, I think it was sixteen people per year at that time. And so yeah, uh, I just really liked it. I took it from there. Um. One of the distinguishing features of uh, Distracted Blueberry is the fact that it's four and a half hours long. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the role of the duration in, in the film and in your thinking about duration. Um, yeah, why is it so long and um, how does that work? Well, I didn't, like when I started out making that, I didn't think it was going to be quite that long. I knew I wanted to make something longer. And I know that I like in a film when an event happens and then you've almost forgotten that it's happened. And then later on, it reference, references that thing that's happened. But you almost, you, you know you've seen it, but you don't even remember, really remember quite what it was. And so... I like that effect, and 
I also I just like being in a in a film that has a change, like has a shift, where what you thought was happening has had enough distance and time that you almost grow out. Like with, for the first half of Distracted Blueberry, it's this kind of really flat, bold kind of potty humor thing. And then I think the second half gives you some uh, greater depth. Like you get this kind of behind the scenes mental um, reading of it, I think, of the of that kind of first part. Um, so I like that effect. And I also like Um, I like films that are just sort of doing their own, um, th that are doing their own thing. And like, I, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> yeah, well, I know my question might've sounded skeptical, but, um, it's, uh, part of the power of the film, and in general, I have to say I'm a fan of a durational film, uh, or what I think of that, right? Um, the conventions of like an hour or two hours for a feature film, it's, um, well, what it's kind of truncated, and it's nice to be able to sink deep into the work and to really, you know, uh, undergo it for a long time, right? And, and let it to pour over you and to do its work. Um, it's, it is, um, well, what to say? You've already answered it in some ways. Um, the, the, part of the question for me is to say, like, how did you know when you got there to be like, oh, now, it, now this is the ending? Because um, there is an interesting dynamic of, like, echoes of the, early characters early on, but points where you've really drifted far afield from um, some of the original scenarios and it's not clear that this is continuous at all, you know? Well, I remember the day where I thought I was done. And I remember like I had sort of congratulated myself and I remember uh, going on, just going on a bus ride to think that just as a pleasure bus ride, thinking, oh, I'm, I'm done, I can go um, enjoy myself. And then when I was on the bus right away, I got all these new images for an another scene. And I and I just was sort of haunted by them and then I couldn't stop. And then, I mean, really, I probably would have just kept going. I would have, I would have kept going if I didn't really think that that I was pushing people's attention spans a little too far. Uh -huh. um, just, I mean, I just really like being in the in the in the space that it made. Um, but I, I know that there's a limit, like, of even something that's in, even when I'm watching something that I like, I like it to end. Like, huh. mm. um. So I knew, I, well, anyway, when did I know that when it was over was when, yeah. when I felt like something had happened. And I mm -hmm. felt like by the end of it, when I watch it, I think it ends really perfectly, actually. Like, I think it really, I do have a sense that something has happened. Yeah. Um, reflecting on your remark about that you do want it to end, um, and especially, you know, even specifically the way that uh, Distracted Blueberry ends right, it doesn't fade out, it's, it's actually an interruption. And um, I was startled by it. And hearing you say it, it, it evokes for me like punctuation, like it ends, and then there's a completeness to it, or there's a point where, you know, now you've got a now you've got a complete phrase. Mm, yeah. Um, it, in a maybe different, but also sort of formal vein. Uh, so Distracted Blueberries in French. Uh, your other featured film, uh, Ponytail, is in German. And uh, the colors that, I'm not going to say it right, the colors that make up uh, white. You're close. You're close. You're close. Is in yeah. uh, Japanese. Um, yeah. 
for an English speaker, part of the effect then is also kind of a characteristic feature of your feature films then is that there's subtitling. And uh, so questions about what? Sort of what is the basis for the choices of these different languages? How do language and text function in your films and their making? Well, uh, yeah, I think each each kind of voice, each way of speaking, has a um, a kind of personality and a kind of. It, they also have kind of cultural uh, associations too that you're playing off of, and um, I mean, I'm really interested in the kind of texture and different kinds of warmth of a different voice, like they're, they're text-to-speech voices, so I'm, I'm going through the voices and finding languages and things, uh, and if I hear a voice, sometimes I see, I'll see just like an image of a certain thing that could be said using that voice, and, um, and then I'll, I'll usually research, like I'll watch like for the, the Japanese one, I'll watch Japanese films just to get a sense of what kinds of phrasing and what kinds of things I'm working with and and with the French one I think I, before I made the colors I wanted to make a French one but I felt like I wasn't ready for the challenge like it felt like there's this like when I watch French films there's a lot of um a lot of talking and that's like, you know, you can have a really awesome French film that's just people sitting around talking about stuff most of the time, They're like pretty introspective stuff. And so, you know, I knew it would be a challenge to really take up a kind of philosoph philosoph <laughs> philosophical um, component that that would challenge me with. And there's also a kind of romantic feeling of the French. Um, and so I wanted to do something that was, had a kind of sense of romance, but but not too obviously, I guess. Not too, like curtains blowing and flower petals and stuff. Uh -huh. A little more abstractly. That's interesting, so that, uh, it effectively becomes a French film, yeah. a German film, yeah. and as an inspiration into the language. That reveals a lot. Um, sort of uh, in that vein, you know, I'm thinking about how you think about the relationship between sound and the image and the dialogue and the text. I don't, tell me if I'm wrong, there are points where there's real continuity between them in the sense that uh, a boombox is playing and uh, sound from the boombox is coming out or somebody talks. But in other respects, there seems to be a degree of like independence between the different layers of the film so that the, the dialogue or the text doesn't, well, it doesn't correspond per se to the image, but also the sound isn't necessarily like complementing in the background. It's kind of its, its own thing up front. Uh, do you compose the scenes as holes or do you, do you see what I'm saying? Or are you composing these pieces with a certain degree of independence and essentially trying to sustain that in the composition? Well, it depends on what I'm inspired by, what I'm initially inspired by for a scene. Sometimes I'll think of it, the sound will be the driving thing um, that makes me want to make the scene. Like the red room parts, I knew that it was, you know, that audio would be the um, dominant component of it and and then um, other scenes it could be something that somebody said so those um, that, that I'd want to sort of like 
hold back on the other elements to make sure that whatever that person said was impactful in a way. Um, but yeah, sometimes there's like a real... I was just watching kind of clips of it, and I, I noticed the audio a little bit differently this time because I maybe I hadn't heard it in a while. But it is really... It does feel sort of like another piece of information outside of the image and outside of the, the relationships of the the characters. Sometimes it's his own character a lot of times. Yeah, very powerful, uh, sometimes intense uh, feature. Um, oh, this is a question. This is actually drawing on another interview that I uh, read where you explain your process as describing an idea or a subject through a process of negation, which you, which you explain as describing by not describing it, but by filling in all the things that are around it. And I was wondering if you could unpack that further, like what do you mean? And maybe even specifically uh, how that's operative in uh, Distracted Blueberry. Well, I feel like, um every film has a kind of a, a secret that I'm I'm not quite sure what it is while I'm making it. It's not like I, I well I sort of lightly know what it is but I'm usually working around it to try to figure out a way of sort of like, you know, figure ground, like if I'm sort of, if I sketch up the night sky, the figure will sort of be left there somehow in people's minds, but I don't want to say this is a figure of a, a, a man juggling or whatever, like I, I kind of rather just feel like it's my job to sketch out all the space around the man juggling and then, you know, have that ability for people to to sense their own coming together of those those missing parts mm -hmm. how, and, they, how okay. they resonate sorry sorry to interrupt yeah yeah i think that's what keeps keeps people's attention in invested in something is if there is that sort of missing part the unspoken part And in terms of your having an idea about it, is it in some respects that it's elusive? In other words, it's an idea that maybe you can articulate directly, that uh, it really can only be, it only can be sort of manifested in its effects? Or is it something that you, where you're, you're like, this is a film about? Well, usually other people are better at saying it than I am, or, or figuring it out. Like, I'm, I might be able to figure it out in a couple of years of, after thinking, after making made it. Yeah, but it's not, it's not a, that's, that's, I mean, it's sort of helpful that it's not like, um, you're not keeping a secret, it's a secret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's in the nature of it. Um, you know, I, uh, part of it too is in thinking about this, like thinking about that autonomy of the, the different levels of the form of the film, you know, part of my seeing that in Distracted Blueberry came from watching um, Ponytail, where, uh, again, that seems to be even maybe more um, featured. Uh, one question that I have with respect to uh, Distracted Blueberry, but then again, across the spectrum of your um, feature films is uh, about the role of narrative. Like you talk about, you pres effectively present Distracted Blueberry as the story of a performance art band, uh, and yet um, the narrative element is, I would say, quite abstract. And the film seems to be featuring rather like affective intensities or, you know, juxt here, I've got my notes here. Right, that there are other as all kinds of other aspects. Like you said, it's more philosophical uh, powerful juxtapositions of images and ideas, affect, limit experience. Um, 
is it important to you that it's a story? Um, yeah, what's the role of narrative in your filmmaking? Uh, I feel like there is a pull to narratives that um, I would really like to be better. I, I feel like my films would be better if the narratives had more pull and were more thought out. Um, I, I sort of flirt with narrative a lot. Like I, I don't want it to be a, um, an empty flirt though. Like I want the, I want there to be some kind of like ABC quality to the narrative. Um, not just like A and then T. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard. I mean, sometimes I, mean, I like I like watching films that have a really definitive narrative, but are but that are also uh, open. Yeah. Uh, just stepping back again, because or if, or if I can just add my two cents, like thinking about or or I'm just remarking on Distracted Blueberry. On the other hand, the Colors film uh, that's got a very uh, explicit and developed narrative. It seems to me. And uh, Ponytail, on the other hand, it's, it's got some really developed narratives, but you also seem to be playing with like narrative tropes. Like um, there's a point where it really starts to read like melodrama, or there's another point where it reads more like um, in other cinematic uh, convention. So you've clearly got the, you've got the chops to, um, to have a, you know, to employ narrative in different ways, it seems. Um, but so it is a narrative uh, arc or something along those lines that you're thinking about in the organization of Distracted Blueberry too, that um, despite the fact that it's as long as it is and the five years that you were working on it, that um, you had sort of an idea of a story that you wanted to tell. Yeah, but... It just occurred to me, I was just thinking like, I feel like a narrative, like a good narrative is probably something that's built by a group of people in a, who sort of bounce around this thing before it's even made where it's, where the ending is figured out and you have this sort of moment of like understanding and everything. And then, and it's really sort of planned and and I, I, I want that, but I also want this other thing where it's this one-on-one -on -one kind of, it's just me making this and it's me sort of to you and it's, and it's me willing to say um, personal things and, and to receive personal things. And, and so I think there's that weird clashing in that too like this yeah mm -hmm. there's i mean people say things in it that you would just you wouldn't see in a kind of more narrative or like a more traditional type of film yes well it's it's got a real subtlety too in that respect between having some uh sustaining continuities but then otherwise having almost um well, I'm, this, I got hints of this again in terms of reading that interview, but it seems to have almost like collage effects. I heard you describe uh, part of your practice as collecting things along the way, taking pictures and writing, and um, that helped me see the film differently, where to say like, oh, this might be some element in its own that is um, sort of, you know, uh, taken out of context and, and developed, um, again, with almost like a collage. Yeah. Is that fair to say? That, that, yeah. yeah. Um, in a different vein, uh, Distracted Blueberry, it seems to me, is a lot about the body. And uh, I had a, a couple of different questions. You know, or, or here's how I you know, take it a step back, that there's a way in which uh, the film 
has this liminal hallucinatory quality um, and it's a dreamscape and it's a psychic uh, symbolic space but it also seems to me that the movie is um, intensely visceral or it's, that it's con and visceral in a whole bunch of ways and uh, one of the first aspects is uh, you know thinking about in, in just at the level of the animation that a lot of what is presented, and maybe it's, you know, I sort of wonder, is it, is it fundamental to um, animation, like embodied movement, right? That the film is, uh, a lot of it, um, yeah, again, moving figures. And uh, the movement in um, the film, it is, on the one hand, uh, believable, in the sense that um, you're, fully engaged with these uh, characters as um, characters. But on the other hand, um, there's something that's, uh, there's a kind of disembodied element to it. And there's like a free floating, um, there's kind of a unique physicality to the movement. Uh, um, almost sometimes like a hovering and an oscillation. Um, anyhow, I, I, I just wanted to ask you first about sort of the animated body. Do you think about that? Sort of the, uh, do you think about, are, are you thinking about the animated body, about the body and movement? And, you know, how does that body relate to embodiment otherwise? I, when I watch um, some computer animation, well, like most computer animation, to me, it doesn't, I, I see the figures not as sort of as believable characters, but they're like ideas that don't quite, um, I don't believe in them as, I believe I'm talking to you. I, I want my characters to be, if possible at times, they, they could be believable as characters. And that's um, not a, an easy thing. Um, to do, you sort of have to really think about all the different things that make up a a, um, a character, like the way they move, the way their eyes. Like a lot of it is in in the eyes and the eye lids and the mouth and all these qualities. Like I, I you know, because it's so artificial. And I work really hard to get it so that you have these characters that are that do come across as lifelike. And I use uh, sort of different, like in the film, there's different parts. There's some, sometimes there'll be these more cartoony wooden movements that are contrasted against those, the more lifelike animations. So I, yeah, I do think a lot about what it means if a, if a character is pops and comes together as a character or not. Cause it, you know, I want to see that happen in a film I want to get sucked into it in that way yeah but as you're speaking I'm thinking about the sort of two that there are formal shifts right that's sort of one principal style but then there are these formal shifts or thinking about the the automatons the, the robot women uh, there it's almost as though you're sort of reflecting on that the different ways in which the body can be read you know more or less I guess believably, you know, just as a almost a note on that idea of the believable. In a way, it's sort of like, oh, is it a matter of it being natural? But, but in a way, maybe that's a mistake. You know, I don't know that this is what you're implying. I don't think it's what you're implying. But reflecting on it, you know, that it'd be a mistake to assume that sort of so-called natural movement is what's you know the most believable because people don't really move like that anyway. <laughs> You know, I mean, how character is and how we relate to each other. It's, um, well, it's more complicated and actually I think probably more inconsistent. Um, another aspect of embody the embodiment in your film, it seems to me, is in terms of its affective intensities, like... Uh, there are a number of scenes that are, it might, be too, it might be too reductive to say like that are a punch in the gut, but uh, that really take hold of you in a 
visceral way. And um, I'm interested in that. Is is that a motivation? Is that a register? I mean, is, am I, is this my unique response? Um, or is that sort of part of the language of your filmmaking? Well, with this film, one of my um, initial goals was to get away from language because in the colors to combine to make white are important, there's so much language and, you know, I, the last, I think, 45 minutes, it's just talk, talk, talk. <laughs> and I thought the next one, I wanted to see how little I could have them talk with their mouths and, and think about actions, think about when, how people walk across the room or like what I can do with the body instead of with the, with the talking. And so the first part, I mean, if you notice, there's, it's barely any, any talking, like the, the, it's very limited. And then there's more towards the end, but um, yeah, so I think what you're feeling is me seeing what I can do with the body and, and just connecting physically in that way. That uh, explains a lot. It's effective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really very effective. Um, maybe this is another aspect of it, but um, thinking about bodies and the role of bodily fluids in the film, right? Bodily fluids are really um, central to a number of scenes and almost as a formal element. I was struck at times by um, the way in which uh, bodily fluids... Um, became, um, what to say, you know, sort of immediate in co as colors and shapes and in, in a kind of modernist, almost formalist way, but again, also with a kind of um, immediacy. Um, was that, a, again, is that a, an explicit formal strategy? How did you um, start to work with bodily fluids like this? Well... It's an indicator of, of like uh, life. Like if you cut, if you cut open a, an orange and it's, have you ever cut open an orange that's um, like two months old or just old? Yeah. And it's like all, um, it's like cork. <laughs> so I think yeah, I was interested in in this sort of inner inner in, in indications of life, but in in different ways. Each fluid um, has its own kind of symbolism and its own meanings and its own comfort level. Like usually, anything in outside, inside or separate. So anything coming from inside to outside is like it's intimate. And it's like, is there more stuff inside? Like, is there this, this is the inside coming outside. Um, but I'm, and I think that's, an, you know, the same with thought and things like, it's like when I read or when I talk, this is my inside coming outside. Um, so I, I, I think it's just a, an indicator of intimacy and, Yeah. sharing that yeah yeah when you put it that way it's um like and i think there's a lot of this in the film right kind of an exploration of the, the boundaries of the self and the extent to which uh what we assume to be our boundaries can be uh, or are are more unstable you know it's kind of investigations of these boundaries how about animation and performance art is there an intrinsic connection between the two? Or how did you come to that inspiration? It seems um, insightful. Well, actually, I'm in a band. I'm in a band, oh. I'm in a band and uh, we're sort of like an art band. And I, I think I was just imagining what our band would 
would be like if it was a little different, a little more hardcore. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of hardcore, but we're not, we don't do like the, that kind of, I mean, we're shy, so, you know, we just, we barely move on stage. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, and clearly, um, Distracted Blueberry can do things that uh, the rest of us can't, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a freedom there. Um, has, did making the movie change your, your band life? Do they speak to each other like that? Like, is the band different now, having made the movie? No. 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 <laughs> You still got your style. You know, we have a, um, a number of questions coming through uh, the chat here. Um, I have a last question, uh, if I can, um, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll turn it over here. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of art in the film, that art is effectively a topic in the film. And uh, there are scenes like there's, uh, scenes set in galleries and there's the oral sex and the statue and there's paintings uh, floating in the ocean. I just wanted to ask you about that. Um, what is the role of art in the film as you understand it? What's it relation to, uh, the, you know, I, I couldn't help but see it in relationship to other aspects of the film, specifically the treatments of sex, intoxication and ecstatic violence. In other words, um, do you mean to be presenting art along that menu, uh, sort of along that spectrum? Um, yeah, what's its significance here for you? Uh, with the art in the film, I feel like the, it's like um, these icons of art that are being used and they, they're sort of so well known that they're not known as an identity. Like, I, it's almost like, you know, everyone's got a phone, but I'm not sure if anybody actually knows how it works. So I was thinking about these pieces of art that are, um, that are almost like um, sacrifices to identity or like their, their identity is art. There are pieces that, whose identity is art, but they feel somehow sacrificed in our consciousness. And I don't, I don't know if, um, if anyone actually cares about them. So like, um, I think that, like, having one of the one of the things I think in the film is just like um, when he's this phrase, "Do you remember me?" Right. And I'm, I'm thinking like about the me and about the remembering and about the really getting to know something or really getting to know somebody and and our relationship to art is like going to a museum um, and seeing it amongst a crowd of people versus having something that like your daughter made on the fridge and seeing it every day and and having that and that thing populate your consciousness as a piece of art and these different levels of um, depth uh, having art experience so I was thinking about I guess a lot of stuff about art and like I, also because art's just part of my um world it's a big part of my world so it enters the film in, its, in a way yeah it's uh that's compelling your reflection on the do you remember me and how we assume so much and to be like oh that's much more complex and elusive um but then yeah right that in a way that's part of the challenge that you're confronted with too uh i i take it as to um you know, actually sort of engage people beyond um, assumptions about what they um, think they're seeing. Um, let me open up the floor here.
So um, looks like Denal Springer, if I've got that right, uh, asks what kind of artist films, movies have really informed your work growing up to currently? I'm curious about where you gather inspo from. Um, where I gather inspiration from. Um, this is such a complicated question because I'm always watching stuff and reading stuff. And so I have these like, little flies that are, my plants are emitting these little flies. Um, so it's kind of hard. I mean, I just read um, The Last Man. Um, um, by Blanchot, by Blanchot. Um, and I really like that. Um, I really like uh, Clarice Lispector, I really like, um, I mean, a lot of, I like, I was sort of getting into Godard, um, I don't know, like, I, I just, I, I mostly listen to things, like, I, I'm a big listener of things, I listen to quite a few podcasts and I'm always listening to the radio so the, my biggest inspiration is really words and just hearing when I hear something that's really simple but descriptive or if I read read to something I'm I'm just looking for this something something simple but somehow not simple <laughs> that's what I'm looking for that inspires me yeah I don't know if it's exactly a follow-up, but can I, does that, you have a, a practice of an automatic drawing, automatic writing, is that, um, is that something that you're doing consistently, like as a daily meditation, or when you're uh, inspired? I mean, it seems like that would be a source for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm writing a lot every day, like, um, I have these little pieces of paper that I write things down on, and I collect them. I don't draw that much anymore these days. I did draw a lot, um, but I'm drawing less. Like I'm drawing in the computer, but actual pencil paper, I'm not doing that much of. Another question um, from Baguette. Uh, Barry, I'm wondering what advice you would give to a new animator just getting started. Uh, Do the hardest thing you could ever imagine yourself doing and don't take shortcuts. Don't use program shortcuts. Don't use program defaults. Get away from automatic tweening. Get away from lazy stuff. Do the hardest thing you can do. That's what I, that's what I want to see. Nice. High bar. What are you excited about in animation or experimental film right now? From Slam Gurry. Um, I really like that dude Chen. He's this uh, Chinese animator, makes short films. These kind of weird, perverted. He's sort of moving into doing music videos more so, but there are these weird, like, sort of gay like sex stuff but it's not um it's like really cartoony and, and bizarre and um i really like uh amy lockhart's animation um as far as animation goes i, I I wish there was more that came across my eyes that really blew me away. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this stuff, I, I like, I like animation. It's just, 
I watch mostly live action stuff. Some of the audience is um, seconding your uh, recommendations. Here, there we go. I love talk, talk, talk animation. How does your music practice figure into your filmmaking practice, if at all? Uh, the music, um, well, they're different things. I mean, the music is a combination of of words, and then I, for the band, I write the lyrics, and Dennis sings my lyrics usually, but he will, there's a back and forth, like I'll present an idea. Sometimes we have guest vocalists, sometimes we have guest people, but it's really everywhere. Like, um, but Dennis is really good at editing and backing forthing with me until something's uh, more whole. Like, it, he's good at, at knowing when something's whole. I, I tend to just go on forever, and I, I need some sort of back and forth sometimes to put, it, put edges around something. He's really good at that. Um, but I play, I don't formally play. Um, I'm not trained, but I just play, I just pick up an instrument and I play it like a punk. So how does it inform my animation? I don't know. I mean, there's, there's kind of two different worlds. Um, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's like listening, I guess. Hmm. Um, here's a question uh, from Michael. Um, your work is very flat and raw, and the characters are clunky and often violent. But how you maintain, so how do you maintain such warmth in them? Well, I remember my drawing teacher, one of the best drawing teachers I ever had, on one of the first drawing classes that she taught, she put, um, she had a chalkboard and she just put two dots on the chalkboard and, uh, and she said, these are eyes, and we all recognize them as eyes, and you connect with them as eyes. And, and so I've always thought about that, um, how sometimes the more realistic you try to draw something, the, the farther away you can get from it, giving you that sense of life and sense of realism, because you're sort of like, you're close, but you're not close enough, so we become more critical. But if something is uh, sort of stylized and has this kind of cartoon element, you can get away with a lot more. You can connect a lot faster, I think, if there's a certain level of stylization. So that's the kind of strategy that I've always um, really felt was important, that knowing when what level of detail is important, like... Yeah, and that it might be more compelling if it's raw. I think that's um, in some ways counterintuitive, but it makes sense. Yeah. Um, we've only got one more question here, and uh, we are making good on time, so maybe we should uh, wrap things up. But uh, the last question is, what is your favorite kind of bird? Um, oh, a peacock. A peacock? Yeah. Have a why? Why a peacock? Well, when I, when I was growing up, we had a farm and we had a peacock. I remember it was really pretty. I can imagine. Yeah. All right. Well, Barry, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today. I really enjoyed the conversation and um, learned a lot. And again, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to show Distracted Blueberry um, uh, from the gallery here. And likewise, thank you so much for presenting it and and talking with me about it and thinking about it. 
Um, it means a lot. Well, I hope we can uh, talk again, talk further. And um, okay. thank you to everyone who uh, logged in and, and came out uh, for the artist talk today. Uh, we're grateful for your support, and uh, we'll see you again soon, I hope. Take care.